So we have the Z390 Dark. So we're gonna open it up, go over the specs with you, do some overclocking, look at the BIOS, and just tell you what I think about it. So let's get started. All right, so this is everything in the box. Um, so basically, you get SATA cables for every connector on the board. You get SLI bridge, some anti-vibration mounts, some nice big brass standoffs, and IO shield, Wi-Fi, pretty much standard stuff. Uh, you also have two probit connectors. Uh, the drivers are included on a flash drive, not a CD. And we have this thing right here. So this is just a PCB. Um, and essentially what it's for is if you're doing any benching, so you don't have to use like a wet bench or anything like that. You can just use these standoffs, put it in there and put the board on top. Uh, also, this doubles as a sort of layout of what is on the board. So for example, your M.2 drives, you know, your socket, and just gives you a whole map of the board. Um, it's kind of cool to have this, though I'm not sure that anyone's actually going to do anything with this if they don't do benching, and even if they do, they probably already have a bench to put the board on, but it's kind of cool nonetheless. So here's the board. Uh, there's kind of a small amount of I.O. actually. So we have four USB ports here. These are Gen 2 ports. Uh, we have a Gen 1 USB-C. We have your standard uh, sound here. You'll notice that all your connectors here are 90 degree connectors. So they're actually stepped into the board, which is nice. We only have two dim slots. And something else you'll notice is the CPU and the memory slots are rotated this way. So usually you'd have your dim slots over here. Um, so EVGA did this just for overclocking reasons because it gets it out of the way of the power distribution to the CPU and you have the data signals directly to the CPU which in theory should uh, provide an increase in uh, memory overclocking, some extra headroom. And they have this giant VRM heatsink on here takes up like almost a quarter of the board with just the heatsink total. This is a 17 phase VRM. We have 12 for the CPU and the other five phases are for and all your other voltages. But we have 12 dedicated to the actual cores, power reset switch. We do have a mounted USB port. These slots are actually a uh, surface mount uh, slots. So they're a little bit different than a regular dim slots. In theory, I think the service mounts ones will give you even, even a tiny bit of headroom. They're really trying to maximize everything on this board for overclocking. So the service mount slots, the rotated socket design, the super overkill VRM, uh, everything is really maximized for overclocking. And you don't get a lot of connectivity in the back like you would with super premium boards. Like from Asus, you always get like 10 USB ports um, or just like ridiculous levels of connectivity. You, you just, instead on this board, you get a very minimalistic design and that looks really cool. There's no RGB on here and uh, it's really meant for overclocking. Um, you'll notice you have three PCIe slots, 16X slots. This slot is actually a slotted slot so the back end of the slot is actually notched out. So you could put a something other than a 1X card in there. Though running this full of PCIe devices probably isn't good because this is still, you know, mainstream Intel. So you're still looking at a limited amount of PCIe lanes. So let's get this uh, VRM heatsink off and uh, I'll show you guys the VRM. So all these screws holding this on are all Phillips head. There's no back plate, which makes it super nice. 
very not fiddly to take off. There it is. Like I said, 12 phases. For the CPU, all the other phases are for everything else. So we're going to put a 9900K in here and uh, do some VRM thermal testing. So we've been running RailBench for about an hour or so, and this is with 1.35 volts with a 9900K. So the top number is the thermal couple on the VRM inductor. That is the heatsink on the outside of the heatsink. And this temperature here is ambient. So this is what you're presented with when you first go into the BIOS. It comes up every time. So in order to get to the actual BIOS, you just uh, go to enter setup. And if you're familiar with uh, EVGA's BIOS, this is going to be pretty much exactly the same. Um, if you're familiar with other companies' BIOS, like Asus, Azeroc, uh, it's going to be quite a bit different, but it'll have a lot of the same options. So the first tab is actually your overclocking tab. So we have tons of options here. Uh, then we have our memory tab, and we have all the, the options that you would want to change in the memory. And then our advanced tab has all the other stuff. So your CPU configuration, onboard devices, all this stuff. Then of course you have your boot uh, settings. Now one thing I did notice, if we go to power management, there is nothing for turbo boost. So usually there's a couple options to increase the maximum wattage that your CPU is using. So if we go to power management, it's not there. If we go to CPU config, it's not there. Um, we do have some C-state options here, but even if we go to overclocking and we scroll all the way down, you can see there's no options. It's all voltage control and frequency. So that's kind of odd. Usually there's at least something for power management. Um, as well as this, the low line <laughs> operates a little bit differently. So if we go to VDROP, that's going to be your low line. Uh, your LLC setting essentially and they're in percentage marks so disabled is obviously no LLC or no VDROP and then we have 25 increments um, this has a feeling of more accurate LLC as opposed to uh, like what ASUS does like level 1, level 2, extreme uh, they, they don't necessarily really mean anything also to note um, your VTT is right here, so usually it would be over here somewhere with your other voltages, but it's actually in the memory tab. So this motherboard actually has a speaker built into it, um, so you get that kind of old-fashioned computer boot sound. You can actually just turn that off, or um, also there's some other options here under power management, dark mode, so that basically turns off all the LEDs on the board. Other than that, it's pretty much a standard BIOS. There's nothing real too special about it. If we actually go up here to extras, we can do a stress test. Um, so basically what, what that is, is the board is just going to run uh, like a Prime 95 app without you having to boot into Windows. And that, that'll that give you a reasonable estimation of your temperatures. You have the OC robot, which is uh, EVGA's automatic overclocking thing. You should just probably ignore that. Um, there's no real reason to use these. It's super rough overclock. That's pretty much the BIOS here. So we're going to get to some overclocking. Let's go through the overclocking on this board first. So firstly, your post LEDs are white, super easy to read. And every time this thing boots, you can totally tell when the memory is going to train, when it's not going to train, and it trains even super tight timings very fast. It's really nice to work with. Out of the box, this board actually came with BIOS version 1.03, um, and it just didn't like my A2 layout DDR4 at all. It just, even the XMP profile, I was getting memory errors, it wouldn't overclock it, it, anything. So, swapped in the A1 uh, PCB layout DDR4. And it was great. So if, if you're getting this board, you're going to want to update the BIOS if you're using A2 layout DDR4. 
and that's just the the 4400 plus DDR4, the super fast stuff. We do have a three selector switch on here, so you get three BIOS, which is is more than anyone could ever want or use. I mean, if you need three, you're doing something wrong. Um, but this board does have a custom BIOS if you want to bench on Windows XP because it actually enables the AS Media SATA controller, which you're going to need. And so it's kind of cool. You can throw the switch to, say, position 3 and just load the BIOS on there and just have it on here. Now, if you're going to be benching with Windows 7 on this board or installing Windows 7, which you shouldn't be doing, you're going to need some a couple things. So firstly, this, like all Z390 boards, it's a really pain in the ass to install Windows 7 on any Z390 board, just because the USB controllers are integrated into the chipset. And there's no Windows 7 drivers, there's no Windows 8 drivers, there's only Windows 10 drivers. And so you're going to need a USB to PCIe card, so an expansion card that gives you some USB ports. Uh, if you're going to bench on Windows 7. And uh, this isn't the board's fault. This is nothing to do with the actual board. It's just the Z390 chipset. All Z390 boards are like this. I've said a couple times that this board is built to overclock, and that's true. But it's also true of a ton of Z390 boards. They can overclock great. But what makes this one special is it's just ease of use. Uh, just the little things that uh, make overclocking just go smoother. Now, there are a couple boards that are in the same league as this board. So the Z390 Apex comes to mind. Um, you don't actually have to get this board to overclock. It's expensive, it's nice, but it doesn't come with a lot of the, the extras that other boards come with. So no RGBs, it's pretty plain layout. There's nothing extra in the box, like no USB devices or audio devices or anything like that. Like I know Asus loves to put extras in their boxes. This comes with what you need. But because this is a niche product, it's quite expensive. And you do get what you pay for. This is a great board, absolutely fantastic board if you're into overclocking. I would recommend getting it only if you can afford it. Only if you are an extreme overclocker, you, you like overclocking. This is, is one of those boards that are very niche, that you don't necessarily have to have this board to overclock great on Z390.